Hello, everybody. I hope you're well. On this edition of the Wheel of Cycling podcast, I speak to Fred Wright of Bahrain Victorious. We look back on his involvement in an epic edition of the Tour of Flanders, where he placed eighth last week. We look at the intervening week, and then we look ahead to Paris-Roubaix, which, by the time you watch this, will have happened, but we talk about the prep for Paris-Roubaix. And we also do a deep dive into nutrition on the bike and how things have changed over the last few years, as well as the tech behind riding on the cobbles. I hope you enjoy it. He's a brilliant, brilliant rider, a lovely lad. I had a lot of fun. I hope you would too. It is it's working. That's that's good. Um, Fred Wright, thanks very much for coming on the We Love Cycling podcast, mate. Um, and it's worth noting to our listeners and our viewers, you were thirty seconds early, uh, which is which is which is very good. Were you were you were you was the the type of chap to be on time? Are you pretty good with time timekeeping? Yeah, I think my sort of youth days spent part of the British cycling program has left me quite regimented in terms of timekeeping. I think it was always when I was younger, it was always like, oh, you've got a when I was sort of 16, 17, it was always like I had the 10 minute rule was a thing. So we had to be at, if, if you were given a time, you had to be there 10 minutes before. So it was always, I think I've always ended up being, as a result of that, been quite fairly punctual. Fair enough. I remember. Well, they're saying that, the, yeah, the people that listen to my mates that I ride with will tell you otherwise, I think. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Fair enough. I used to, um, back in the day before we had phones and watches that synced so everybody's basically on the same time i used to i was early for everything because my clock was set early so oh, okay. uh or was it late no i think my clock i cut i basically adjusted my clocks so i was always early uh, including getting up in the morning um but then you can't do that anymore because you can't really adjust your phone <laughs> can you no you can't you can't it just it, i was just in a perpetual state of confusion as, as, as a child <laughs> um <laughs> nice <laughs> fred my, you we're obviously recording this on Friday, you got Paris Bay in two days, um, and uh, just a week ago now, I was down in Belgium commentating on an epic Tour of Flanders, of which you finished in in the top ten again, eighth place, wasn't it on the day? Yeah, that's right. Uh, first up, how are the legs after that just incredible race? I think I, yeah, again, similar to the year the year before, you finish and you're absolutely, you, you just. I almost sort of feel a bit tingly because I've got so I'm so empty with nothing left. It's kind of I think I've only ever had that feeling before after Flanders in all the races I've done that that emptiness is it's like nothing else because it's you know six and a half hours and the way it was raced was <laughs> I mean it was yeah non-stop more so than previous years as well. I think it was yeah from whatever people were saying and people watching it it was one of the the, the fastest and hardest Flanders ever. So, yeah, it was the yeah. fastest. I mean, me and me and Rob Hatch in the commentary room, looking at the race, waiting for the break to go, and we're like two hours in, and the break's not even gone. It was insane. <laughs> that, I mean, just, that was our fault. It's like we were one of the teams. We were one of the team. Like, I was a bit like, oh, okay, you know, the team meeting beforehand. It was like, yeah, there's a bit of a chance of wind, so let's try and catch out, you know, some of the big guns by maybe causing some splits, a bit of you know it's one of the big guys a bit too far back or whatever and I think there were some other teams that were keen for that as well so it just meant that they just keep the break like they'd never really let anything go and it just it just meant the first sort of even I think there was one pause like you'd have in a normal race and that was still there was maybe then about 2015k to the first time Quermont yeah and from then on it's just flat out so it was really it's mad how six and a half hours can go by so quickly yeah because <laughs> I mean, you're just on it the whole time yeah it, it looked it looked incredible i mean you've got obviously the, the you've got the, the two extremes that the two classics with the most extremes i think are flanders and milan san remo two beautiful races but yeah. so so different i mean do you obviously the, these days with um nutrition and the monitoring of, of of diet and stuff do you know how many calories you spent uh, in Flanders, can you tell us that roughly? I think it was it was oh just over seven thousand. Just over, <laughs> that's amazing. I, I'm pretty sure that's what my uh, thing file said, which Flipping is neck. quite quite something. Yeah, you know, just, just trying uh, to work out how many pizzas that is stacked yeah. up. <laughs> I just think of it in yeah tubs of Ben and Jerry's. That's seven tubs of Ben and Jerry's 
Flipping heck. Roughly, I, I reckon. Maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. We'll have to do, well, we'll have to get out the research team at We Love Cycling to find out the facts of how many Ben and Jerry's tubs that is, mate. Well, that's a, <laughs> and and what about again? Just, uh, numbers do fascinate me. It's not all about the numbers, but you know what what it does, especially these days for people, is just set things in stark context. I mean, seven thousand calories. What was your normalised power? Did you, did you are happy to say what that was? Roughly, I think it was it was it's roughly between like three forty and three fifty. I think. I think, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's quite, yeah. quite, quite something, quite tasty. Yeah, that, that is pretty, t- no, no wonder you felt tingly afterwards, mate. Yeah. <laughs> because you pretty get, pretty tasty. I mean, just go, obviously you, you, you're in great shape. I mean, it's a, um, just to describe what it was like being in that group. Um, I mean, basically, I mean, me and Rob, would, again, we're talking about the race and, you were there as one of the favourites. You got the three big favourites who ended up first, second, and fourth. Basically, you know the three we're talking about, um, and then you in this next tier of riders. And basically, although there was some horrible crashes that, that we know about, and oh, oh by the way, um, uh, Matte, I hope is he okay? By the way, after that crash, yeah, he's he's raring to go for Sunday. So that's he's, good. That's good news. That, that a, was he was hard. pretty pretty uh, sort of grazed up because of all the places to crash in the race. That's that was one of them where you you're always there at that point thinking. Oh, it wouldn't be nice to crash now. <laughs> you were so, moving, yeah. weren't you? That was a yeah, you're, you're sort of 50, 60 k now. Yeah. yeah, you're shifting there. So, no, that's he's it. he's he seems he seems himself. So that's, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's good. But just describe what it was like being in that move. Then, I mean, it was all the big favourites there. I mean, um, I, I've read a, an interview that you gave about one in like everybody. Everybody was talking about this. It's the new buzzword, isn't it? Anticipation, like trying to open things up earlier. And the more that's talked about, and the more you need to do that because of the ridiculous talent, some of the riders that you're against, t- t- going man to man with some of those guys, it's almost impossible at the moment, isn't it? Let's be honest. Um, yeah. So you've got to think a little bit differently. But so the race is getting opened up earlier and earlier and earlier. And you were talking about watching Mad Pedersen go a little bit earlier. So just talk us through that scenario there. What were you thinking? How are you feeling? Because it's it is about moments, isn't it? It's a six and a half an hour race, but ultimately there are little decisions that you make which can turn the race on its head for yourself, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a that's a good point because you know like we said about the the early break taking so long, it was quite clear from the start, okay, this every team has sat in that meeting, not the teams with the the top those three guys and gone, right, we've got to anticipate. So it just makes the whole everyone's <laughs> trying to do the same thing, and I think you know it's it meant that yeah the first you know you saw DSM trying to do that slow tactic, all these teams trying yeah. to do different things, and it was you know we sort of knew that after the Mollenberg that that's where that's where really that that sort of anticipating move with strong guys was going to go, and yeah I got positioned into there perfectly, and yeah I was straight away it was like okay here we go this you got Kuhn, we've got a couple of, you know, you want a couple of satellite riders from the big teams there as well. So, you yeah. know, with Trentin and Van Hooydonk there, it's like, okay, this is, this looks good. And yeah, I mean, we had to, you know, push on quite a lot, but I was really surprised at how big the gap was. You know, the, we, the, it's like we knew they were coming, but, you know, <laughs> when you're coming into second time Cuervon and you've got, you know, two, almost three minutes, it was like, wow, this, you know, for me, it was all about getting over the the Koppenberg ahead of them. Yeah. That's the sort of climb where you just. It's, I, I kind of know I don't have the legs to follow them when they go. Sure. So straight away it was like, okay, we're we're going to get over the Koppenberg, and then it's. But then then you hear on the radio, oh no, they're come. You know that they were coming. You know, <laughs> forty seconds, sort of <laughs> thirty seconds, and then it was like, oh, but it's only wow, well, it's only wow, well, it's been dropped. And it was like, okay, that means they've obviously gone really hard. You know, it's not been easy for them if wout has been dropped and it's just today and Mathieu. But I think the problem was is when you when I said about Pedersen is he, at that point, you know, you're so tired. It's been still been such a long race. You've still got to go up the Quermont and the Patabo one more time. And I was thinking about what would happen when they come and how I could get a result from that perspective. But yeah. actually... Pedersen was Pedersen was still in his mind thinking, "How am I going to win the race?" Yeah. Like I, I, I think the rest of us were like, "Okay, they they are coming now," whereas he was still like, "No, no, I'm going to keep keep pushing on and just try and keep getting ahead." Like you know, which was the the goal of us sort of 
the kind of riders that we we were that were there. So I think it's just that moment where because he rolled off the front so easily, and it was he just did. right in front of me, and and I was like, I just sort of no no someone else would close, and then everyone sort of think because you know you got another climb coming up, and you're like oh no I'll I'll uh, you know that was you know it's maybe a yeah that was maybe a mistake because I, I you know I could could have been probably could have been with him whether it would have worked out the, the way it did but yeah I think it's all these it's that sort of staying positive no no I can still try and try, try and beat them and he you know he nearly he wasn't far off being you know he was, it was only on the, the sort of road after the Claremont I think that Pogaccia came past him but yeah I think Pogaccia is just unbelievable like when he when he went on the Claremont I was just you know what? What, what can you do? I made the mistake last year of trying to hold on for too long, and I, you know, really, I just had to ride my own pace with sort of Askreen and Kung, and sort of see what the gap is at the top, and and just hope that you know, in the, the headwind coming into the finish, that we could close something. But no, it was not possible. <laughs> yeah, it was um, not possible. It 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 is, it is amazing how I mean, for yourself, for all of us, we're we're, we're watching these these amazing talents and you're an amazing talent yourself fred you know you've you're still very young in your career you've got you've got it all to come you're getting better and better all that you're gaining all this experience as well confidence but it is you know what's it actually like being immersed in the race you're talking about you're on the radio and you've got oh the big three are coming the big three are coming it's almost like you've been chased by a shark or something it's like this yeah. sense of anticipation yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not like a normal bike race when everybody's kind of even there's a hierarchy but there's kind of the hierarchy sort of blends in. Now you've got this this rarefied atmosphere of these three or four riders right at the very top, and the rest, everybody else, are trying to find out what they can do. Do, do you think it's changed the, the psychology of the way you're racing a little bit as well? Do, uh... I think I think so. I think it's you know as you see in all the races, it's like winning them is getting harder. It's yeah. almost getting harder because of these you know these guys. So it's yeah, teams are thinking of different just so many different other ways of ways of doing it. Oh, we send one guy here, we do that. It's yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's it's I really the thing is it's so hard because everyone really wants obviously I really want to win Flanders, but it's how it's thinking about how I guess yeah, it's a move like Pedersen, who knows? There's yeah. still a bit of randomness in Flanders. But that's what I think that's what's so great about Roubaix is that it's not set in stone that that's those two are going to be fighting out for the win like it, it might happen but there's so much more that else going on that really any anyone can win yeah i think i think you're graphic. right i think uh it's a different set of physiological demands isn't it um it's a little bit more equal uh, i think it's fair to say isn't yeah. it? if you're smart as well you can be as smart as you like in flanders but ultimately if you haven't got the legs you know, you're not going to be there. And even yeah. even playing a canny game in Flanders, you've got to be so so strong because there's just no hiding places yeah. there. But in Roubaix, it's it's a little bit different. But I think it's far more open. I think the the winner could come yeah. from 15 riders, perhaps, couldn't it? You know, and and I'd like to include you in one of those, really. So yeah, that's what's that's what's really exciting. I mean, it's you know, there's there's a, it's nice as well because there's sort of a randomness to it with punctures being unlucky that almost takes a little bit of the pressure off you know you kind of you know what you're going to do to got to do to put yourself in the right position and then you got to sort of I mean you can create your own luck a little bit in in Roubaix but at the same time you know just some someone might someone's there's always someone that's chasing back on if you have a punch or there's always this yeah I was just watching the last year's race and it's just absolute just bodies everywhere <laughs> it's <laughs> it's crazy you know yeah I mean, yeah I think like for me personally, I could sort of, you know, I know what it takes. I can see myself, you know, getting on the, like last week, I think I was again, closer to a podium in, in Flanders, but I can't like envisioning how it would work to win. It's, it's a lot more difficult than, than in Roubaix. I think, you know, what, if you sort of see yourself, what, how it would happen, it's a lot harder to see, I think to see the Flanders win and you know, you never know with these things, but with, with Roubaix, it's yeah. Yeah. Anything can happen. Yeah. I mean, just, just talk a little bit about the, uh, 
but what this week has been like in terms of obviously the races i mean again reminded we're recording this still got a day and a, a bit to go so what what does this week look like for you um in terms of trying to recover from that tingly feeling of being completely <laughs> utterly empty after emptying yourself of seven thousand calories in in and i'm going to say it again i i think it's, it's probably the best flanders i've ever seen in in my career i i, I think to be a part of that race you know a key part of it mate uh, must make you feel very proud as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting. I think, well, whatever happens, you can that's look back at me that. feel a bit, making me feel a bit tingly. That's, that's well, nice. there you go, mate. I like that. You know, it, it it is. I mean, you know, I think everybody. It was such a complicated race. Um, there was just so much going on. It was. You, know, you couldn't have written a more beautiful script for that race. I don't think if you're writing, a, yeah. you're writing a work of fiction on 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 the ultimate Flanders race, you were part of it, mate. You were one of the big yeah. part. You're a big part of the story. Well, there's. There's some confidence going into Sunday then. <laughs> there you go, mate. There you go. There you you know. go. And, and, and no, you, I think... Yeah, sorry. You, you, and, and you've got the legs. You've, you've got the legs and, that, yeah. and that's it. Just, uh, I think you can draw a lot from that experience. Um, and it's like you said, they're different races and difficult to see a scenario right now of how you'd win Flanders. But as you say, when you look at Roubaix, it's, it's a little bit d- different and you know you've got the legs, mate. And it's just about trying yeah. to... Yeah, trying to... To see what happens on the day, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, like you were saying about like this. Yeah, this week has just been just trying to. Up until Wednesday, it was like, okay, I feel really dead. <laughs> you know, it's just e- eating enough, and then also just spinning the legs, but yeah, very, very small amounts. And then, yeah, the recon we did was was yesterday, and that was a chance to sort of open. Open things on, up a little bit, but mostly just to get a feel for feel for the cobbles because they're, co- they're different cobbles to yeah. Belgium. It's not the same. It's not the same vibrations. It's very much, much, much heavier duty. So, no, I think to be honest, from the feeling from the recon was a little bit of fear from just some of the mud, some of the mud on some of the sectors was quite something. Like right. in terms of. You know, I was sort of there thinking, "Wow, I wish I was I'd grown up doing cyclocross because <laughs> it, there was a couple of sectors where you're more think I was more sort of thinking about staying up on the bike than actually sort of putting the putting the power up. I guess it's, I mean it's it's different in a race, but that is again going to throw another sort of randomness level into the mix when you know all of a sudden the the guy in tenth wheel can still come down and if there's there's a bit of mud, so. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think everyone was saying the same thing and it's going to dry up. I mean, I'm constantly looking out the window like, is, is it rain? Is it because the rain's still been a bit on and off today? So it's it's like it's almost more slippery, I think, than when it was really wet because right, it rains okay. a bit and the mud kind of there's nothing to wash the mud away. Right. Almost. So the sectors that are muddy, I think, will stay muddy. So I'm trying to make a mental note of all the ones that potentially have mud on just to be extra, extra careful. But yeah. Bloody hell! No, interesting it's, one. Uh, it's it, it's interesting you use the word. I, I've never raced Paris Bay, mate, but I've ridden the sectors numerous times with GCM back in the day, and I, I can honestly and I, me and Lloyd, you rode like you did, but about 110k from Arenberg, basically, in all the sectors to the finish. Yeah, and yeah. I can I can honestly say we we hit it as quickly as we we, we could, probably only about 45k an hour rather than 60 or 70k an hour. But I can honestly say, and this was like six seven years ago, I was actually frightened. I was actually scared and it was yeah. uh it was like bloody hell and it's before they'd actually they go and clean the Arenberg a little bit don't they and it was this was yeah. really mossy and i can honestly say mate it's the, ske- the sketchiest i've ever felt on a, on a road yeah. bike through yeah. through the Arenberg. It, it's i mean and you've raced it this will be your third roubaix won't it this year so uh, yeah. just describe the Arenberg and how what it's like well <laughs> <laughs> to be honest from a racing perspective i've not yet made it the last two times i've done it i've not yet been in the race I've I've got to the finish both times, but I've actually my race has been over post Arenberg right. both times. So first sort of big sort of tick to go for is that I get past the Arenberg. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but no, it's good. Yeah, I think it's uh it's the worst one by a long way in terms of just the start because you hit it with so much speed and there's I think it's just like someone's just yeah. I've heard people say it before, just like they've thrown the cobbles onto the onto the ground randomly. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just yeah you really get you know hit a lot harder than 
than than some of the other sectors. And yeah, it's just the speed you come into it. It's really like you know, close your eyes and and go in sort of thing. Yeah. It's I think for me though, I, I'm almost a bit more tentative in a recon. I think come race day you're caffeined up, you've got so much focus that you almost you get to the finisher of your Rubain and you're like, wow, that was we were doing some crazy stuff there. Yeah. But when you're in it, you don't you're not you're not sort of you don't really have time to think about that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's a good point actually. The yeah, because you're in a completely different headspace, aren't you? There's, there's, there's less stress. You, you, it's a different sort of focus when, you, when you're training on a, on a recon. Um, but you just got to get through it in a race. And, and and again, on a recon, you can actually concentrate on picking a, a kind of line, I guess. And But if you're in the group and you're not right at the front, even if you're six or seven back, you're not picking your own line, are you? No, you're no. Basically no. just seeing where the bike will take you. And as you said, yeah. th- those cobbles are terrifying. They really, really are, mate. But um no, it's, I think uh, with Aaron Berger, for me, I'm always like, if, if, as long as I'm not on the left side, okay, that's okay. The left side at the start is the worst bit. Okay, it's what I've been told. I've never actually done it because I'm I've been scared for of going on the left side. But right. from what I've, I've been told, just just don't be on the left, and then it's a bit better. Good stuff. Good but, stuff. Yeah. So just from a tech, uh, a, an equipment perspective. Um, compared are you you're riding pretty much the same setup that you rode in flanders or you won't you'll have a closer ratio block in the back you'd imagine to give you a bit more so what sort of setup are you going to ride for roubaix compared to flanders yeah flanders i think chain rings it will be sim- the same on the front so yep. i think 54 or 54 42 pretty sure okay. yeah but then on the back it's i had a 34 in flanders whereas there's no there's no need for it in in roubaix so that's that's one change, and then I guess I've got non. I had just aero standard aero handlebars for Flanders, but I've got just rounded ones for Roubaix, and then and then slightly thicker tires. So we were running thirty millimeter tires in Flanders, and we're running thirty twos in in Roubaix now. So okay, that's the other thing with the recon. It's like, oh, what pressure are you going to go? Oh, I'm going to go a little bit yeah. down. Now. I'm going to go a little bit higher. It's, it's quite. That's it's like the really biggest, the talk oh. of the re- recon is all just about tire pressure. I know I was going to get run. really geeky and ask w- w- what pressure you're going to run. And I remember doing um we were with the Quick Step team when Bonin was riding, and um I went to ask because we were doing this video, and I went to ask one of the mechanics what pressure Bonin would be running, and he said I'm not telling you. <laughs> he said because it's a secret because they had all these well yeah that... big graph on the wall in the inside of the bus about the the, the ideal tire pressures, and it's something that you learn over years. Different obviously you've got different race conditions, different rider weights. Then within that, there's like a personal preference of what you want to run a little bit hard, a little bit softer. So th- there is a kind of science there and they were really, they just wouldn't give us any information about what they were running in case we went and that information became public and it was like secret source stuff, you know, it's. Yeah. yeah. No, I, for me, it's always about, you, you do Aaron Berg is the real test. And it's like, how many times did I hit the rim on Aaron Berg? And, and and that's if it's if there's like a kind of threshold of if it's too many times then you might want to go a bit harder yeah but if it's not too bad then it's then you then you're okay so that right. was kind of my test because then after that you never get sort of bashed around quite as much as yeah. you do on Arenberg so it's normally from then on it's it's okay so but then it's also like the first you know there's the first 110 k is a pretty uh it's, it's going to be really fast yeah. on Sunday. You know, to talk about this anticipation thing, it's going to be. I'm predicting it's going to probably be the fastest, one of the fastest Roubaix starts ever. I reckon. Just is it cross tailwind again? Is it a similar direction the wind for, for Flanders? Then is it? I'm not I, really going to look. I, I, I haven't seen the wind yet, but I just think I just I feel it's going to be really fast, and that's always the you know you you sort of start the race and it's like oh everything just feels really spongy. You know, like, oh god, I got to do. It. 110 k's <laughs> on this kind of because it's quite a rolling road as well. You're going up these hills and it's like, oh, it doesn't feel. I guess you've got to sort of tell yourself that it's not actually that much slower. It feels spongy, but the the rolling resistance I think is not. It's not so much worse, I believe. Anyway. Yeah, it, it it's it is. Yeah. I know, like going back to when I was ride, riding in in Flanders as an amateur, we were like riding 20, 21, 22 mil tires with a hundred. It just seems. Tires. I just. I'd... chapeau hats off to all the people the thought now of doing it on anything less than a 28 is like 
God, it must be crazy. <laughs> yeah. But we did, yeah, with the just it wasn't the knowledge, you know. It's just um it is amazing how far the tech side has come. And I was I was, I was reading a um an interview with I know it's, it's Fabian Cancellara's piece on cycling on cycling news that he does, and he was saying that he feels that the equipment has made it a little bit easier. I mean, you've I get. Did you ride junior Paris Bay? If you, if you, if you, yeah. That before? I mean, I, I mean, I, that's. I mean, what are you now? Twenty four, twenty three, twenty three. Yeah. So that was we were. I was. I remember. I, I got myself some like Vittoria twenty five mil Parve tubs. Both years I had them. Yeah. So they. Yeah. Again, that, that's probably with around. I work in. I've switched over to bars now, but okay. <laughs> but I think it was we probably had about ninety psi, ninety five psi, in, which is quite, quite a lot. Yeah, <laughs> quite high. I seem to remember the mechanic when we were juniors. He he asked everyone what pressure they wanted, and he put in ten psi more than what everyone said, just just because they didn't want any pinch flats. <laughs> Flipping heck! Yeah, it's quite funny. Oh, that's funny, mate. That's funny. Uh, are, are you are you, you going to sit and watch the women's race, the wins race on tomorrow? That would be an interesting one, too. Oh, especially when in relation to what you're just talking about, the conditions, although they might change overnight, but that will give you the, the conditions aren't going to massively change from tomorrow, are they? No, no. I think it's it's really good always to see see the cobbles, especially. I mean, two years ago, the year Sonny won when it was horrifically wet. It was almost bad watching the women's race because I was you know sitting there like oh my god tomorrow we've got to go and do this but no I think it would be really good to see just just which ones are mine it's basically how Mons and Pavel was the worst was the worst one and that's yep. sector 10 or something and I think okay. yeah see that's the one I'm is in my mind like oh watch out so we'll see it see that how that how it happens there Brilliant stuff, mate. Brilliant stuff. So, following Roubaix, what's what's in store for the rest of the the next phase of the season for you? Are you having a bit of a rest and then recalibrating, or I'm, what's the score? I'm I'm doing I'm doing Amstel after Roubaix, okay, and then and then I'll I'll have a bit of a break, and then it's just all about building up building up to the tour again, basically. Yeah. So, I'm I'm hoping the legs are still good for Amstel, but Roubaix is very much on the forefront of my mind, and I'll be yeah and. Uh, Doing well in Amsterdam is, is would be nice, but I've got a feeling that my legs are going to just start. Just <laughs> it's you know you can only race and hold on to your form for so long. I feel like it's going to start dipping at some point. Yeah, especially if you have another day because it, it's pretty sure uh, you're going to have a tingly feeling at the end of Roubaix as well, mate. There's going to no, be that's, the chain's going to be tight sure. all yeah. day long, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be completely empty on Sunday. So yeah, brilliant stuff, mate. Brilliant stuff. Well, Fred, it's been a pleasure, mate. I won't take. Any, any more of your time it's uh it's it's been it's always a good laugh speaking to you oh actually one thing i do want to know uh, what's what's your routine pre in in the morning then i mean in terms of because you look at the, the calorie expenditure there and there's been a lot of chat recently about um not carbo loading as much the day before and spreading out in the week and having more on the day and eating more on the bike so how how are you fuel are you fueling a bit differently than you were a few years ago now yeah I even even compared to last year i've got a bit more of a plan in place so like even today is i'm eating more than you would on a day where you've just done one an easy ride for example like today's right. quite already feeling quite a lot today and then tomorrow you know spreading it out so it's not just one massive evening meal you know you have a, a big breakfast sure. a big lunch big big dinner and then a then a, another pretty big breakfast on the morning of the race and then yeah i think what's really changed even in the last year is just the amount everyone's making trying to eat on the bike i think even yeah i think before people were talking oh you want to have 80 grams an hour and now everyone's like oh no you want to push for 120 and even more so it's yeah. really kind of i don't know what that is in calories but yeah it's a lot i think the nutrition side of things is really sort of opening up oh you know and like, yeah. obviously but what, what it's done in terms of um i mean there's a lot of things going on in terms of um that just what you guys are what athletes endurance athletes are able to do this is going faster and faster and faster whatever sport stronger faster yeah. is basically you know even if you would take out the, t the advances in the tech which is helping you move quicker as well but as well as if we are finally un unlocking you know the true potential of human physiology aren't we and, and nutrition is a massive part of that you know and uh, and the, the evolution of nutrition even in the state for years fascinating that you're 
because there was a thought that the body couldn't actually digest more than a, roughly 100 um, grams of carbohydrate in, in an hour. So yeah. you're, you're pushing the limits of like what we previously understood our digestive system was able to do. <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah, it's almost like the people, yeah, that you can train it to train yourself to be able to just take in yeah. as much as possible. But yeah, I, I just fair play to, you know, back way back when people, people were doing Flanders on maybe like three bananas and they still have to get on the pat burger <laughs> after however many Ks. Like, I just can't, I can't imagine it. Because, <laughs> you know, the climbs like that, you you have to put out a significant amount of power just so you don't walk. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So, so were you, how much did you eat in Flanders then? Are you... Because look, just looking at the race, and it reminded me of, of being in races where it's so full on, you actually sometimes physically forget to to eat or even yeah. drink, you know, because you, you've you got to make sure. And and Tom Pickcock said it, didn't he? You know, he was up in that group and he forgot to eat and, and basically blew, you know. Yeah, um, I think I think I had, we worked it out. It was, I think, 130 grams an hour. Right, okay. And I, I almost think that was too much. I was almost sort of, I think there was a couple of times I was feeling a little bit like, oh, oh like I've had right. quite a lot here. But yeah, I think it's just at every opportunity having a gel when you're in yeah. that sort of move. I mean, my, my stomach wasn't in a great place. It took a, took a, that also took a couple of days to recover <laughs> after, <laughs> after Sunday when you're giving your body 10 gels and God knows how much sort of energy drink. But no, it's really sort of pushing. It's just pushing the... Because you're just you are using those carbs, so yeah. like, yeah, that's crazy, really. That you, the amount of stuff you put through your system is it's mental. <laughs> it is a little bit, mate. Well, it's. Uh, I'm sure you're going to be doing well something similar on, on the weekend. Can't wait to watch it, mate. I'm I'm not commentating this time. I'm going to be sat on the sofa, probably watching the whole race start to finish, mate. So, uh, and I just want to wish you all the best. You know. Oh, thank you, you very much. You got, yeah. Oh, you, oh, oh, just yeah. Ha- have a great ride. Um, enjoy it as, as as much as you can did you actually going back to the fundamentals of bike riding i know you clearly enjoy your bike racing you know but um did you at any point in the race because obviously there was a lot of suffering going on that's the thing it looks joyful but mostly it's just hurting uh or yeah. or especially the way that the race was ridden on sunday it's going to just be uncomfortable all day long and then excruciatingly painful near the end but yeah. um, did you ever get a sense of this is fun or was that only afterwards? <laughs> there was one moment. So I know, you know, I had my, my parents and sort of people from my old cycling club, quite a few of them on the Claremont, but I never really, you know, I don't know where they are. So it's difficult to sort of take, take that in. But there was one point on the Canaryburg. So the, the climb, basically the climb just after where Mate crashed. Yeah. Where there were all these people with sort of, with just the small sort of Flanders flags. And because we weren't, you know, the break had been, we'd been, we were sort of established that we weren't riding as hard as some of the other climbs. So you could really sort of like, oh my, look at all these fans. Like that was, yeah. I think that was the one moment in the race. I was like, wow, I'm in, I'm in Flanders. But the rest was, yeah. The rest you sort of look up, look on afterwards. Like, oh, look, there, there, there I was. <laughs> have you, have you watched yeah. it back? Have you watched much of it back or had a chance to? I have, I have bits actually. And just sort of looking at it and being like, oh, why were you pulling there? What are you doing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, you know, it's hard sometimes to watch something like that back because yeah. I, I was, I messed up the sprint a little bit. I probably could have come fifth. There was, you know, there's, there's all these little things that you, I, I'll, I'll definitely watch it back next year in the run up to next year's Flanders because yeah. then I won't be so annoyed with myself for things that I maybe did wrong or whatever. But yeah. <laughs> cool, mate. no there's like like you say every day is a flipping school day on a, in a bike race mate isn't it there's so yeah. you know and and unless you win i guess there's even if you win a bike race there's things you can look back on and think oh, i can I, I could have saved a bit more energy but you're just learning 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 every yeah, single yeah. race aren't you you know yeah no that's why it's that's why it's such a good spot certainly mate there certainly. you go brilliant stuff well i'm gonna leave it to it um have a great race at the weekend mate thanks very much for your time and um look after yourself catch up with you soon Thank you very much, mate. That was that was good fun. Cheers, mate. Take it easy, mate. Cheers. Sweet. See you later.